This is what the death of media literacy leads to, art that looks like this. If you're wondering, Hannah, what happened to your hair? Uh, what did you do? Well, this is what happens when you watch this movie and then you reread parts of this book and then you make a video about them. Cautionary tale to you all. It'll fry your brain. How did we get here? How have we ended up in a place where I literally have photos of Colleen Hoover and Ellen DeGeneres and Blake Lively on my wall when I had previously said that I was done talking about Colleen Hoover's books and I had no interest in making videos about it anymore. You are as shocked as I am. I had no intention of making this video. I had literally no intention of watching this film, but I did end up watching the movie and I just had a lot of thoughts about it and a lot of things I wanted to say. And before everyone starts typing and is like, Hannah, how could you watch that movie? How could you support them? How could you give them your money? I didn't. I didn't. That's all we're saying about that. Moving on. Anyway, I watched the movie and I just really needed to express some thoughts, but I also didn't have enough thoughts to just make a video about the movie. And also I, I didn't care enough to just make a video about the movie, but I did want to compare it to the book because that's what I kept thinking about as I was watching this movie. Being the type of person who is really annoying to watch a movie with when it's an adaptation of a book, because I'm always like, actually that was different in the book. That was something I kept thinking while I was watching the movie and it kept bringing me back here. So basically today we are going to be diving into It Ends With Us, the book versus the movie and deciding which one is worse. The wall serves no purpose other than for me to be able to point at things. I brought a pointer. It's not a pointer, it's actually a spoon that I'm holding backwards because I don't have a pointer. I just wanted something to distract myself while I make this video because I don't know that I can get through it otherwise. I needed something entertaining to do, so we are going to be doing lots of pointing. I'm going to be inaccurately pointing at things because this is reversed for me, so it's hard for me to see what I'm doing, so don't laugh at that. And also it might make it a little bit easier to help compare the two. Visuals are sometimes helpful and this was unfortunately a visual experience I would like to unsee. I am actually kind of thinking of making this into a series about book to movie and book to TV adaptations where we do like book versus movie and just compare them, see how they hold up against each other, see which one is better. So maybe this will be the first video in that series. We'll see how this goes. But we're just trying something new today. I just, I just wanted to have fun. This is kind of like Mike's Mike style photos on the wall, even though they're not really connected to each other. This was very minimal effort, but something about about this experience has to be pleasant because reading this book and watching this movie was not that. But before we dive any further into talking about this book and this movie, I do want to let you all know about the sponsor for today's video, which is Parade. I've worked with Parade in the past and I absolutely love their products. They're an underwear and loungewear brand that creates the most comfortable, stylish pieces that are sustainably made and also made for everyone. I've been wearing pieces from them for months and months now and I absolutely love their stuff. They are so, so comfortable. As a person who genuinely despises wearing a bra most of the time and will forego one if given the chance, I actually like wearing their bras. My favorite piece from them right now that I've been wearing all the time and that I'm actually wearing right now as well is their play triangle bralette. This one is in the color strawberry and it has this really cute strawberry print all over it. It doesn't show any lines underneath your clothing, which is really nice because I do like wearing more form-fitting tops a lot of the time. And it also stays in place and it's really comfortable. I can wear it for hours on end and I forget that I'm wearing it most of the time, which is high praise for a bra. Not something you can say about most of them. They're very inclusive sizing so you can definitely find something that works for you. The straps of this one are also super comfortable. They're just thick enough that they don't actually dig into your skin but not too thick that they're going to show too much underneath a top. So it's just the perfect comfy bra to wear every day. It's my go-to at this point. It's the first thing I grab. I need like three more of them because that's how much I reach for this. I love every single bra I've ever tried from them. They've all been so so comfortable but this absolutely has to be my favorite one. Use my link in the description and my code clock work 40 to get 40% off of your entire purchase, which is a great deal because they already have great prices and try out some of their products for yourself so that you can also find some of your new favorite pieces that you'll be reaching for all the time. But again, thank you so much to Parade for sponsoring today's video. And without any further ado, let's get into this mess. So as I mentioned, I made a video reading five of Colleen Hoover's most popular books. I read through each one. I gave detailed descriptions of each one and explained my problems with all of them 
and that video drained the life out of me because reading those books was one of the most difficult things I have ever done, which is melodramatic and hyperbolic, yes, but it was also horrible. And I read It Ends With Us in that video, so I described a lot of my thoughts and my opinions and my critiques of it in that video, so we will be rehashing a bit of that, but mostly I kind of just want to explain the plot of this book and this movie today so that we're all on the same page and we know what we're talking about, and then explaining to you why I think both of them are extremely bad. <laughs> I'm just kind of comparing the two to see how they hold up to each other. So it goes without saying there will be spoilers for both It Ends With Us the book and It Ends With Us the movie. Spoiler alert, they are almost exactly the same, so if you've read this, you know what happens, and if you've watched this, you know what happens in the book. So really, it doesn't matter if you've consumed one of them or the other, you're good to stay here. If you haven't watched or read either one, good for you. I hope this video persuades you not to. <laughs> Contrary to what people might think of me because I love criticizing media, I'm not actually the type of person who would say that this book or this movie should never exist in the first place. Like, I'm not trying to ban books or art or anything. That's completely antithetical to everything I believe in. However, I do think that things like this deserve critique, and I also am an advocate of people not wasting their time. And I believe that both this book and this movie are an absolute fucking waste of time. A couple of quick notes before we fully dive in. So first and foremost, despite the fact that the movie and the book's marketing have done a very poor job of making this clear, the story is actually about a very serious issue. It's about domestic violence. So we're going to be talking about that a lot today, so content warning for that, and I will also be referring to it as DV because I do not want to get restricted or demonetized, so just know that. And then also, less important, but I will not really be talking about the celebrity drama that's been kind of going on with the marketing of the film and with the film in general. Um, we'll touch on it a little bit when we get to the movie because there are a couple things I do want to mention. There are some serious things that are actually worth having a discussion about in all of this, but most of it is just gossip and none of us know what is true and what isn't true, and I'm not adding fuel to that fire. Anyway, those are my quick notes before we dive in, but now let's get into the book. So It Ends With Us was published in 2016 and written by none other than Colleen Hoover. Colleen Hoover is now um, one of the best-selling authors of this generation by far. I believe last year her book sold more copies than the Bible. But in 2016, she published her novel, It Ends With Us, which was based off of, as she mentions in the author's note of the book, a lot of personal experiences from her life, living with a father who was abusive towards her mother, and also her work as a social worker. Of all of her books that I've read so far, at least, and based on her own descriptions of it, probably one of her most personal novels. And the one that I believe she has also mentioned is the book that she actually tried to send a message with. There's some quote where she talks about how she's never really trying to send any kind of message with her books, but It Ends With Us is the first one where she actually did that and she was trying to send a particular message. Does the message come across very clearly? Sometimes yes. Is it very well executed? No, not particularly. But you can tell that this book is very, very personal to her. When I read it after I was reading all of those other Colleen Hoover books, it is probably the one that I feel, despite the fact that I don't like it, it's the one that I feel is definitely one of her better books, simply because you can feel that there was more effort put into it. That's not to say that it was good, it's just to say that you can feel that she tried. But what is the book about? It follows our main character named Lily Blossom Bloom, who is a florist. Yes, that is her real name, first, middle, and last. Yes, she is actually a florist. No, I'm not messing with you. Yeah. <laughs> Lily is 24 years old and it starts off right after she has left her dad's funeral and she's on some rooftop and she's trying to deal with the complicated emotions of grieving her dead father who she actually didn't really have the best relationship with because he was also very abusive towards her mother. So while she's on this rooftop contemplating these very complex feelings, <sighs> Justin Baldoni shows up. Not really Justin Baldoni. Ryle Kincaid, our 
leading man, if you want to call him that, Ryle Kincaid. Yes, that is also his real name as well. She does make fun of the names. I will give Colleen Hoover that one thing. They do make fun of her name being Lily Blossom Bloom and how ridiculous that is. I don't remember if in the book they make fun of his name being Ryle. In the movie they do make fun of his name being Ryle. She's like, that doesn't sound like a real name. So I'll give the movie that point, but we're jumping too far ahead. We'll get to that later. Anyway, Ryle shows up on this rooftop and he starts kicking a chair because he's very angry and he doesn't see her yet, but eventually he sees her, they start chatting. She literally just told him that her father just died and he was uh, not a good person and she doesn't really know how to f deal with these complex feelings right now. And that's why she's sitting on this rooftop at night and she's kind of sad immediately. And I mean like immediately, this man is like, I wanna fuck you. So, um, yeah, that is who we're dealing with. Anyway, Lily is rightfully so put off by this and confused by him. She is a little smitten with him because she thinks he's really hot. So there's that. She's also 24 years old. So she's never really been in a serious relationship in her life. She's only had one kind of relationship before this that ended very tragically that we'll get to in a second, but she's never been in a serious relationship and she also also grew up in a very difficult and toxic household. So she doesn't really have the best grasp on what a healthy relationship or what a healthy dynamic between two people should be. She's promised herself that she's never gonna end up like her mother. Although the, the whole point of the story is that in some way she feels like she is doomed to repeat that cycle. So yeah, I'm not gonna blame Lily for the majority of the choices that she makes in this book or the feelings that she has for Ryle. Honestly, all of that can be traced back to the toxic situation she was raised in and lived through, and also uh, how manipulative and horrible he is, and the fact that she is so young at the same time. That combination of things is setting you up for a dangerous situation. And that's not on her. She is, however, really dumb a lot of the time. Would I make those choices? No, but also it's easy to say that when you're not in somebody's situation. Anyway, I digress. She does end up leaving. She thinks she's not gonna see him again, but she's not sure. Then at this point, we realize that the book is told in two different perspectives. So first we get Lily's perspective in present day where she's 24 years old, she's living in Boston, and she's trying to open a flower shop. That's what's happening when she meets Ryle. Then we find out the book is also told in a second perspective from Lily when she is 15 years old, I think, and so she's still in high school. And this perspective is told through letters to none other than Ellen DeGeneres. No, I am not kidding you. She writes what is essentially a diary, but instead of addressing it as Dear Diary, she addresses every letter to Ellen DeGeneres, the one, the only. In her words, Ellen is kind of like her idol. She's just looked up to her forever. And so everything she's describing that happens to her when she's 15 years old is in a letter to Ellen DeGeneres. Yes, it is that ridiculous. Yes, it's actually worse than it sounds. I could write this off as just being funny and silly and just a ridiculous thing that a 15 year old girl would do, which it kind of is. However, the thing about it that pisses me off is that to me, this felt like it was Colleen Hoover's way of saying, look at me, I'm not homophobic because my character actually likes Ellen. And that was her version of being inclusive and including like a queer character. <laughs> that is what I think she was doing with this. I could be totally wrong. I don't know, I'm not in Colleen Hoover's mind, but based off of the five books of hers that I have read and the fact that she is horrendously bad at including any kind of diversity or representation in any of her stories, it, that is what this felt like to me. This was just her way of being like, I'm not actually homophobic. See, she loves Ellen. That's why I hate it so much. That and the fact that it's just like deeply unserious to tell a story about DV through letters to Ellen DeGeneres most of the time. It's just, it's absurd. <laughs> anyway, so in these letters to Ellen DeGeneres, most of the time, Lily is just describing the relationship that she has with a boy named Atlas, 
who is homeless and living in this abandoned house that's by her house. And she sees him there and she tries to help him out. She brings him food, blankets, stuff like that. And they develop a relationship. They both realize that they were both raised in really toxic households, Lily with her father and Atlas with both his father abandoning him when he was young and his mother who is also very toxic towards him. So it's two people who are in very bad situations in their youth kind of trauma bonding together over the similarities that they've experienced in their lives. Atlas is 18, Lily is 15. They are both in high school though, so it's not the weirdest thing that she's ever done. All that being said, I don't even really have a problem with Atlas. Like there's no real issue with it. The best parts of the book are actually the conversations that Lily and Atlas have with one another. I feel like those are the times where Colleen Hoover actually gets the closest to having any kind of in-depth real discussion about these social issues and where she does any of the character development and growth for these characters and for the story itself. They're probably some of the most honest parts of the book and the most readable parts of the book, except for the one line that I will never get out of my head. If you were wondering what this picture is, because it is actually kind of small because I printed it too small, we don't have to talk about that. This is actually a picture of a cow standing in front of some manure. And this is a reference to one of Lily's many letters to Ellen, in which she says, Ellen, I am confident that the next sentence I'm about to write has never been written or spoken aloud before. When he was wiping that cow shit on me, it was quite possibly the most turned on I've ever been. Yeah. Yeah, unforgivable. <laughs> I say that, but honestly, there's so much worse in these books. It's not even that bad. It's just cringy and gross. So anyway, we flash back between these letters from when she's 15 to present day again when she's 24. So what's going on in the present day? 24 year old Lily has just opened up her flower shop and who comes waltzing back into her life? None other than Ryle, who is actually the brother of the friend who is helping her open up the flower shop. So Ryle comes back in and this man immediately wants again is just like, I want to have sex with you. Like I need to, my life depends on it. He is on his knees begging quite literally at a certain point, he gets on his knees. He starts almost crying because she hasn't slept with him and he really wants to sleep with her. And he feels like he just needs to sleep with her once and then he can get her out of his system. He's a neurosurgeon and he's doing his residency and he feels like he's not going to pass his exams and he's literally going to fail if she doesn't sleep with him. That is how he convinces her to sleep with him. I'm not joking, that's literally what happens. Anyway, after that, he promises that he'll stay out of her life. He does stay away for a while and then he comes back eventually and then is like, I do actually really like you and I do really wanna be in a relationship with you. Eventually she agrees to be in a relationship with him. Then they've been dating for some time and that's when he starts getting even worse. There's an incident where Ryle is trying to take a, a casserole dish or something out of the oven and being the idiot that he is doesn't use any pot holders or oven mitts or anything. He just touches it and he burns his fingers and he apparently had like a serious surgery or something coming up the next day and so he couldn't damage his hands and Lily's just like kind of giggling at him or whatever and then he pushes her or hits her or something. I think he pushes her and then she hits her head on the counter or the floor or something and then he's like super apologetic Apologetic. He's crying. She's crying. She tells herself, I can't believe he just did that to me, but also trying to convince herself that he's not like her dad, that this situation is different, you know, guilting herself into staying in the situation, which all of that is fine. Like I actually have almost no problem with most of the perspective we get from Lily and the way that she feels about herself and the situation that she's in. I actually think it's like considering everything else, not that poorly done. However, there are so many times when Ryle does something terrible that I feel like the book is kind of trying to get you to feel sympathetic for him. You could have that conversation maybe with a different writer who was better at having a nuanced discussion about these topics. However, in this, in this, we can't, we can't have this conversation. You can't make this man look sympathetic. Anyway, sometime after that, Lily has convinced herself that this is not the same situation as with her dad and her mom. And then eventually, and by eventually, I mean within like two more months because they've only been together for six months by the time this happened, they decide to go to Vegas and get married, just like immediately. So thinking it through, you barely know this man, um, you just had a situation with him that scared you and made you feel like he could be as horrible as your father was, but we're gonna marry him actually. And she marries him 
And then things start to get worse. At some point in between all of this time, I can't remember if it's before or after, I think it's before she marries him, but they end up going to this new restaurant to try out this restaurant on a date. And the chef who's working there is actually Atlas. I forgot to point to him. He's right here. You can barely see his face. It doesn't matter. He was honestly like hardly in the movie too. Anyway, Atlas is actually working as a chef at this restaurant, which was his dream when they were younger. His dream was to become a chef and he now owns Owns this restaurant and he's working as a chef there. This is the first time they've seen each other in I don't even remember how many years, like five years or something. They end up having like a little moment, but it passes, she moves on with her life, and then she ends up marrying Ryle a little bit after that. So after she marries Ryle, this is when things start to get worse. Ryle ends up discovering that Lily had seen Atlas. At a certain point, they go back to that restaurant that Atlas owns and Atlas ends up seeing that Lily has like a black eye and he and Ryle get into a fight. So he's aware of what's going on with Lily and he tries to convince her to leave him. She won't listen. And he is very clearly disappointed in her, but also sad for her and doesn't know how to help. And she's just in too much denial. It gets worse because at a certain point Atlas comes to see Lily at her flower shop and gives her his phone number and is like if you ever need anything just call me and he puts it in her phone case so that she has it with her in case she ever needs it in an emergency. At some point Ryle accidentally finds that phone number and he calls it and he realizes it's Atlas and then he gets really mad and then he lashes out at Lily again and he is so mad and so distraught he ends up pushing her down a flight of stairs. She gets injured from this, obviously, and during this time is constantly telling herself, like, you hurt me, you hurt me, and he's just like, no, you fell. You fell down the stairs. After this, Lily is like, okay, he is like my father. I need to stay away from him. I need to stay away from him. Then Ryle starts screaming, crying, throwing up, and he is just desperately trying to convince her and himself in a lot of ways that he is like this because of his past, his past childhood trauma. The trauma in question being that when he was six years old, like a child, a very young child, he had an older brother and him and his older brother were playing around and they found their dad's gun. And Ryle accidentally shot the gun and killed his brother. I'm not joking. So this, trauma from his childhood, which don't get me wrong, is a trauma. Like that's an objectively fucked up thing to experience. It would definitely damage you for life. However, to say that because that happened to him as a kid, because he did that as a kid also, he now has rage blackouts where he pushes his wife down the stairs or shoves her against a wall or something. Because that happened to him, that somehow in some way explains some of his behavior. It doesn't, it really doesn't explain any of his behavior at all actually, but you know, we'll move on because that's what the book does. Lily is then really taken by this story. She doesn't know what to do. She feels really bad. She once again convinces herself that this is different from her situation with her parents and she, stays with him again. This man is crazy. He is a manipulator. It's absurd. And she is pretty naive as a person and also someone who has experienced a lot of childhood trauma. Those things do in fact mess you up. However, they do not turn most people into this. It can, don't get me wrong. It's not like it's impossible. It's just, that's not the case most of the time. And I know that Colleen Hoover says specifically in the author's note of this book, and I'm sure she's talked about it elsewhere too, that this is not meant to be representative an all encompassing representation of people who have experienced DV or situations that involve DV. I don't think that's what she intended either, but there are too many moments in the book that make him out to be sympathetic. And we'll get to more of those in a little bit because I think it makes it even worse. And then then at another point, Ryle is feeling insecure about Atlas again because I think some magazine or a newspaper published something about his restaurant and he alluded to something about Lily. And so he's really jealous. And then this time he physically like attacks her and attempts to SA her. At that point, Lily ends up running out and she gets out of the situation and then she goes to Atlas and he lets her stay at his place. At this point, she goes to the hospital and she finds out that she is in fact pregnant. 
Yeah, and she decides to have a baby. She moves back with her mom, I believe. Might be mixing part of that up with the movie, but she gets out of their apartment together and then eventually she divorces him and she says to her baby, it ends with us, referencing the cycle of violence ending with us because she's not gonna go back to him and she's not gonna stay with him. And then in the epilogue, we jump forward a few years, her daughter, who is in fact named after the um, older brother that Ryle killed when he was a child, whose name was Emerson, their daughter's name is Emmy, and her middle name is also Dory, named after Ellen DeGeneres' most iconic role, because there are also a million Finding Nemo references in this book, each one cringier than the last. And she is in a park with her daughter and she ends up seeing Atlas there. And then her and Atlas like kind of reconnect and she tells Atlas that her and Ryle are not together anymore, except for the fact that Ryle still has custody. Yeah, of his daughter. So she is going to drop her daughter off with him because it's his day to have her. And then the two of them are together and happy because she did get out of this relationship, thankfully, but we still didn't really hold anybody accountable for their actions. So yeah, that is the plot of It Ends With Us. So as you can tell, this book covers a very serious subject matter that is not handled with almost any nuance and is told in a very kind of unserious format. It has moments where you feel something, but it is also just a little ridiculous. My two biggest problems with this book are number one, with the content of the book and the fact that I feel like it's actually really manipulative in a lot of ways, and also with the way in which this book has been marketed and pushed as a romance novel, because it is not a romance novel. So many people have gone into this thinking that they are going to read a romance novel. For so long, it has been shelved with other romance books. It's been promoted with other romance books. It's been talked about like it's a romance book. It's not a romance novel. It has a happy ending, ultimately, technically, because yes, she does leave him and divorce him. Yes, she does get to ultimately be with a guy who she did truly love, who was kind to her. And yeah, he wasn't like her savior. She did in some ways, you know, help herself out of that situation on her own, which I think was important for her. But at the end of the day, Day, this is not a romance book. Too much of the content of this novel is about a very, very serious social issue. It's not just like good, happy, romantic feelings with like fun, smutty scenes. That's not what's going on here. And I feel like the way they market this book, even from just the cover design alone, manipulates people into believing that it is something other than what it is. My other biggest problem with this is the fact that I feel like the book is far too sympathetic towards Ryle as a character. I know that every situation is different for every person, and I in no way think that the book is trying to say that this is the way that it should be for everyone, and that this is meant to be representative of all people who've experienced these situations. I do not think that is what she's trying to do. I don't think that was the intent. However, I don't see how you could ever say that somebody who still got to have custody of his child after attempting to SA you, using so much physical violence against you, pushing you down the stairs, shoving you, doing all of these horrible, horrible things to you, I do not understand how divorcing him is holding him accountable. Like, that is what you should do, because you should not be in that situation anymore. But you are not ending that cycle of violence for anyone except for yourself. In her author's note, Colleen Hoover mentions that she had a good relationship with her father despite his behavior towards her mother and how terrible their relationship was and the memories she has of him are happy memories doesn't mean that that couldn't change in an instant. Doesn't mean that that couldn't be different for somebody else. Unless you're writing a personal memoir about like your own experiences, which is what the author's note is kind of explaining about this book and how that's what she was trying to do with this and base these two characters off of her own parents. In a novel like this, I feel like there should be a little bit more thought put into it. We should hold ourselves a little bit more responsible. The fact that he still has custody of his child 
means that he's not being held responsible for his actions. If you do things like this, if you behave that way, you should not be able to be near your child. And even if he didn't have a child, even if they didn't have a kid together, the next person he goes off and dates might experience the exact same thing. The probability is extremely high. Nobody in his life held him accountable. She got herself out of the situation which is exactly what she should have done. But like, that's not holding him accountable for his behavior. This is not even like me having beef with Lily. Lily should have done exactly what she did. In my opinion, she should have done more because I think we societally should do more to prevent people like this from getting away with the things that they get away with. But I'm not blaming Lily. She got out as she should have, but I'm talking about the book. The book doesn't hold him accountable. His sister is obviously sad that her brother is like this and is behaving like this towards her best friend, but she also doesn't hold him accountable. She does nothing. At least Lily was the victim in this situation, but your sister should hold you accountable. Other people in your life, her sister's husband, he should hold her accountable. Somebody should have done something about this man. Nobody does anything about this man. The only repercussion he faces is that he no longer has his wife. He still has his kid. He still has his family. He still has his job. No, like literally, nothing in his life changes. And before someone's like, isn't that realistic? Isn't that what it's like in real life? Yeah, that is what it's like in real life. But then don't tell me that he was held accountable. Like the ending and the fact that he still has custody of his kid, the fact that he is still in her life in any capacity, that should be sad to us. It shouldn't be framed as something that's like, wow, they were able to like work it out for the sake of their kid. No, no. This man should have a restraining order out against him. I just don't understand why the book frames it in a way that makes him seem like he has somehow been held responsible and accountable for his behavior and his actions when he has not been. Absolutely, people are more complex than the worst things they've ever done, which is, I think, a theme this story really tries to explore and fails miserably at doing so. People are more complex than the worst things they've ever done. However, this book is not the place to have that discussion because there is not enough thought or nuance put into it for it to be able to appropriately have that discussion. Anyway, those are all my issues with It Ends With Us, the book. All that said, let's move on to the movie. Before we get into which one's better, which one's worse, the plot is basically identical. So we're not gonna explain too much about like what this is about because it's about this. It's exactly the same story with a few changes, which we'll get into in a minute. They took out some of the most iconic quotes and they changed a little bit of dialogue here and there, but you know, plot-wise, it's essentially exactly the same thing. But I do want to now spend a little bit of time explaining some of that like celebrity drama and stuff that was going on because there's something I do want to touch on. So first and foremost, the movie was directed by Justin Baldoni and it stars himself as Ryle and Blake Lively who plays Lily and then this guy whose name I don't remember and it doesn't matter who plays Atlas. <laughs> Justin Baldoni is also the director of the film. He's also a producer of the film along with Blake Lively. I think Colleen Hoover is also a producer. I'll fact check that in a sec. They are the two main people involved with making this film that are relevant for this case. But first and foremost, we need to talk about Justin Baldoni because the rights for this movie were bought several years ago. I believe in like 2019, at least 2020 is the first time I remember hearing about this book being made into a movie and Justin Baldoni buying the rights to the film. And I remember when this first came out, news about this first came out, he was talking a lot about how he wanted to make this film because he thought this was a really important subject matter to have discussions about. And um, it was really important to him. It was like a passion project. And he specifically, I remember mentioned that he thought that this was a story that should be told by a woman because this is a woman's story and he felt like it needed to have a female perspective and that he wanted to take a step back and make sure that this is a story that's told by women. And I remember this vividly because I remember when I found out that he then made himself the director after saying all of that, I lost my mind. I mean, I knew from the second that they even wanted to make this into a movie in the first place, that this was gonna be a shit show, but I knew immediately when he made himself the director of the film after spewing a bunch of bullshit about wanting this to be like a woman's story told by women, then why would you make yourself the director? I'm a man. And this is a story that is told through the lens of a woman. And especially when it relates to intimacy scenes and to scenes where there is a mix of intimacy and um, violence. I wanted to make sure that those scenes had um, 
had a female gaze. First and foremost, if you really, really cared about telling a story about DV and you thought this was a serious issue, you wouldn't choose this as your source material. That's problem number one. Problem number two, if you really believe that this is a story for women told by women or whatever he was saying, but if that's really what you believe, why are you making yourself the director? Quickly, answer me. Why would you make yourself the director and a producer? And then also make yourself the leading role, specifically the worst character. Why? Why would you do that? Yeah, we know why. <laughs> you would have never chosen this as your source material if you actually cared about having a conversation about DV, and you never would have made yourself the director and producer. Never in a million years. Those are his crimes. That's why I have beef with Justin Baldoni. So all the people who are like trying to defend him for whatever reason in this contrived drama that everyone has come up with, why are you writing so hard for this man? What has he ever done? He's also a Zionist. So anyway, moving on. Blake Lively, I didn't care about most of what was being said, apart from the fact that people are just starting to be misogynistic for no reason at a certain point, which was very annoying. I've seen the clips of her trying to promote her hair care line. I've seen clips of other actors from the film talking about how there are hot guys and hot girls in this film, so you should go watch it. And I have seen the atrocious clip of her saying, grab your friends, wear your florals, and go watch the movie. It Ends With Us is in theaters now, so grab your friends, wear your florals, and head out to see it. I don't know what about this story would ever compel you to say something like that? This is not a movie I ever even wanted to watch, nor would it ever be a movie I would want to watch with my friends. I love my friends. I don't want to subject them to this. But even if that's what we were going for, if you knew nothing about this story, if you knew nothing about this film, that is just so unbelievably misleading. And I was upset before I watched the film. Like when I heard that, I was like, oh damn, that's not good. That is not not a good <laughs> look at all. Then I watched the movie and it made it even worse. As someone who had already read the book and who already knew the plot anyway, this was so upsetting to watch. And if I had watched this without any knowledge of what it was actually about and all I'd heard was the way that they were promoting this film, I'd be pissed. I'm already pissed and I already knew what I was getting myself into. Imagine if you didn't know. That is so deeply irresponsible. Anyway, that's all I have to say about the, the cast drama or whatever. Everyone in this situation is wrong for their own specific reasons. But anyway, the movie itself was bad, unsurprisingly. I didn't think I was gonna like this under any circumstances. However, I didn't expect to be as unbelievably bored as I was the entire time. The runtime for this film is two hours. Two hours of my life I will never get back. Depending on how fast you read, they might be about the same length for you. This probably took me a few more hours in total, if I actually counted, to read than the film itself. This felt so much less tedious than the movie. I will, I will give the book that. This, this felt like I was sitting down for like an extended Lord of the Rings marathon or something like that. Two hours is ungodly. It was way too long and nothing happened. And I mean, nothing happened for the first 55 minutes of the film. Absolutely nothing, no plot development, nothing of interest, just ugly ass outfit after ugly ass outfit. That's all we got for 55 minutes. And then the ugly outfits continued. It's just, then we finally got into like the actual plot of the film as well, which didn't make it any better. I was just maybe a little less bored. But let's get into the major differences between the film and the book. First and foremost, what I would say is probably the biggest difference. Maybe some people don't feel like this was a big difference. I feel like this was a massive change that completely changed the entire dynamic that we have going on in this book between Lily and Ryle because we aged the characters up a lot. Like I mentioned, in the book, Lily is only 24 years old. I believe Ryle is older than her. I don't remember how much older he is, and she's pretty young. In the movie, they don't think they ever say how old the characters are, but Blake Lively is like 35, 36 years old. Justin Baldoni is in his 40s and he's irrelevant, but they're much older. They're at least 10 years older than they are in the book, which completely changes the dynamics of their relationship because they had 
a little bit of an age gap. And this was the first real serious adult relationship she'd ever been in. And also she was so young and her youth and the naivety of her youth, that significantly influenced her behavior, her choices, her mental state. I mean, when you're 18 to 24 years old, you're in like a really different place than you are when you're in your late 20s to mid 30s. This is not me trying to be ageist. It's not like we shouldn't have movies about people who are this age. We shouldn't tell these stories about about people experiencing DV at this age, we should. That should still exist. It still happens to anyone at any age. But a significant portion of the story was because of how young Lily was. Her age influenced the types of decisions she made. You don't make those same kinds of decisions when you're 36. I'm not saying she wouldn't have gotten in the same situation. It was still believable in the situation, but it felt like you were telling an entirely different story than you were in the book. This version of Lily also had her youth as an element to why and how she was being taken advantage of. We kind of lose that here. It's not necessarily wrong or bad, it's just significantly different from the story that we told here. So again, I don't want anyone to misconstrue this and think that I'm saying this can't happen to you when you're like 35 years old. It can happen at any point in someone's life. It's just two very different mental states that a person would be in 10 years apart like this. So. Yeah, that was, in my opinion, the biggest difference between the book and the movie. Another significant difference, in my opinion, and this is not me in any way, do not get it twisted, condoning his behavior, Ryle's behavior, that is, he was way less bad in the movie than he was in the book. The, like, screaming, crying, banging on his knees, crying and throwing up that he's doing here, begging her to sleep with him, he doesn't do that in the same way. Like, he's definitely pursuing her, don't get me wrong. He still definitely really wants to sleep with her and he tells her that multiple times. But this was like pathetic and desperate. This was also pathetic and desperate, but like a lot more subtle. It was still creepy, it was still annoying, but I went back and like reread parts of this to prepare for this video and the difference was pretty significant. In the book, he literally goes and like knocks on like a bunch of people's different doors trying to find her apartment just so he can beg her, and I mean beg her to sleep with him. He does not do the same thing in the movie. He doesn't seek her out in the same way. Like he doesn't intentionally go and find her multiple times. He just happens to be in the same place. So that's when he tries to pursue her. In this one, he like searches for her. It's stalker, like borderline stalker behavior. It's creepy and horrible. This is also creepy and horrible. It's just much more subdued than this version was. So again, not condoning this in any way. His behavior in the movie was just much less desperate in a lot of ways. Another difference is that I feel like in the movie, they try to make Lily a more sympathetic character. I think that they didn't want general audiences to victim blame Lily. And I'm going to say something that sounds blasphemous coming out of my mouth. I never thought I would say these words, but the book is far more nuanced than the movie ever is. Yes, I am saying that there is nuance in the book It Ends With Us compared to the movie. Because in this, Lily convinces herself multiple times that her father is different from Ryle, that their situations are completely different. And she knows what Ryle's doing is wrong and that it's bad. She says that multiple times. She does things that people could quote unquote blame her for. I think that makes her as a character so much more complex because that's the whole point, right? Like someone doesn't have to be perfect for them to not be abused or hurt. It doesn't matter what she had done. She didn't deserve to get pushed down the stairs. And that is a far more complex way of telling and realistic way of telling a story like this than this is. This Lily is so bland. She doesn't do anything. She has no personality. She doesn't even write her silly letters to Ellen DeGeneres. So like, what am I supposed to say about her? She doesn't do anything that could even be misconstrued as kind of wrong or like morally questionable because I think they didn't want audiences to be able to say anything even remotely bad about her. Whereas like in this one, you have to think a little bit critically to understand that like, it doesn't mean she deserved what happened to her though. You have to think about that for a second. You don't have to think for a second here. Brain completely off. And I never in my life thought I would say those words about a Colleen Hoover book that it requires you to think critically for a second, but it does. Even the worst books require a little bit of media literacy, okay? A little bit of the gears turning. And you have to do that sometimes when you're looking at Lily as a character, but you don't with this Lily. Hollywood said, no, <laughs> we don't want you to think for a second. You're just going to like her because she's perfect and pure and she's never done anything wrong ever in her entire life. And you could never misconstrue anything she's ever done or said. So it's very obvious and easy to say, yeah, he was wrong because he clearly was wrong. 
And for people who think critically, yeah, it's very obvious that she didn't do anything wrong and he was wrong, but it still required you to look at somebody as a whole person, mistakes and all, and still say she didn't deserve what happened to her. This movie does not ask you to do that. It asks you to sit there and just listen to whatever they have to say without using your brain for one second. A few more notes on things that I just jotted down while I was watching the movie. There's a line at the beginning where she meets Ryle, the rooftop scene where she first meets Ryle and he's kicking around that chair and he tells her that he's a surgeon and then she starts laughing at him and she says, and I quote, I thought you were a crypto bro or a really expensive prostitute. Moving on. Then they are revealing their naked truths to each other, which is what Lily calls it. And this is, again, on the rooftop right after she has met him and watched him kick that chair around for a little bit. She immediately just confesses to him and says, says this as a confession, as if it's like supposed to be something that's embarrassing. So keep that in mind. She says to him, the first guy I had sex with was homeless. Actually, I think we're supposed to say houseless or displaced. And then she proceeds to continue talking about it as if it's funny that she slept with somebody who was homeless. So like, why are you correcting yourself and saying like, oh no, we should use unhoused or displaced instead of homeless. And then you continue to make fun of him. Okay, anyway, <laughs> there was a jump scare in this film. Colleen Hoover made a cameo. I genuinely got up out of my seat and screamed. A large portion of the dialogue in the film was basically just vocal fry and mumbling. Most of the time they were kind of just like, I mean, yeah, I don't know, like blah, 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 blah. Like that's literally how they spoke <laughs> the entire movie. So it was really hard to understand what they were saying. The soundtrack for the film, Blake Lively being friends with like a huge portion of Hollywood and the music industry, I'm sure had an easier time getting a lot of rights to a lot of very famous songs. So we had Taylor Swift, Cigarettes After Sex, Lana Del Rey, and Ethel Kane. Hearing strangers play within the first five minutes of this movie, I was ready to quit. I literally was so mad. I am like, the number one Ethel Kane stand, okay? Preacher's Daughter is one of my favorite albums of all time. The fact that they played Strangers, do you even know what that song is about in this movie? <laughs> I took that personally. Basically the quality of this film was like a Hallmark holiday movie. That's like the level of effort that it feels like was put into this film. The acting was not good. The script obviously was never going to be that good. The only thing they had going for them was that they had like a star studded cast, but it's not enough to make up for the rest of it. This movie looked like it was made for TV, made to be just like watched in the background at like 2 p.m. Except for the fact that it's about like a really disturbing subject. This is not a blockbuster film. This is not a movie that's supposed to be in theaters. I don't understand how we got here. We do of course also have to talk about the fashion choices. You can't see this picture well enough, but I'll put some up on the screen for you. Every single outfit Blake Lively wore felt like a hate crime. I don't understand who her stylist was. I don't know if she styled herself. I don't know why all of this was going on. Why was it so ugly in every single scene? I don't even like Lily Blossom Bloom, but that was offensive to this poor girl. This is probably one of the worst movies I've ever seen. One of the most poorly written scripts I've ever seen. Again, unsurprising because of the source material, but like to take something this bad already and make it even worse, that's a skill in and of itself. Props to you, I didn't think it was possible, but the movie is actually worse than the book. I would rather reread this book twice than ever watch this movie again. I'm so serious. This is an absolute waste of everybody's time. At least there's like something to discuss here. It might be bad, it might have serious issues, but we can have a conversation about this. There's no conversation to be had here because they don't want you to have a conversation because they want you to shut your brain off. They want you to blindly go into this and just accept whatever they're telling you without ever questioning a thing, okay? This, this is what the death of media literacy leads to, art that looks like this. This is what everyone is saying the death of media literacy leads to and I have definitely felt some of that sometimes too, but at least there's something here. There was a person who felt something, who experienced something, who wrote a story that meant something to them personally. And whether or not it's good is up for debate. I mean, not really, objectively, it's pretty bad. But like, you can like this. I can understand why someone would connect with this. This, 
No, there's literally no way. Like I said at the beginning of this video, would never recommend that you read this book or watch this movie. But if you watch this movie and you actually liked it, read the book. At least there's some substance here, a, a little bit of substance here. This was one of the most hollow pieces of media I've ever seen in my entire life. But anyway, there you all have it. That is it for my review of It Ends With Us, the book versus the movie. Definitively, I have come to the decision that the book, shockingly, is better than the movie. I never ever in my life thought I would say that I like this in any capacity. I don't, let's be clear about that. But if we're comparing these, if I have to pick, the book all the way. Do not waste your, don't waste your time here, but really don't waste your time here. It's just boring, deeply, deeply dull and boring. And especially in a movie that's supposed to be about such a serious topic, at the very least, even if it's not well written, it should still be somewhat captivating, even if you're watching out of horror. But no, I wanted to turn it off so many times. There was nothing going on and it was so dull, so poorly written. It was unfathomable. I hope it was at least somewhat enjoyable for you to watch me rant for, I don't even know how long. My voice is literally starting to go out at this point. I've been talking for too long. So that means it's time to wrap things up. But if you enjoyed this video and you would like to see more book versus movie comparisons, let me know. Cause like I said, I really would like to make this into a series. I think it'd be really fun to do because I love watching book TV and movie adaptations. It's literally one of my favorite pastimes and comparing them to the book. Yeah, let me know if this is something you are interested in. If you've read the book, watch the movie, let me know your thoughts on either one, how you think they compare to each other. Did you think the movie was in some ways more enjoyable than the book? I can see the pros and cons, mostly the cons on each side and how they would outweigh each other. So I'm curious to know what you all think. But that is it for this video. If you'd like to follow me on any of my social media, all of my links are in the description box as always. I'm at clockwork underscore reads. Also, if you want to know what other movies and stuff I've been watching or TV shows I've been watching, you can follow me on Letterboxd for movies and Serialized for TV shows, both of which will be linked down below. But thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you very soon in my next video. Bye.